Here we are in James, the second chapter. I want us to go back and pick this up. I want to show you some things out of James. Um, the one thing you need to really be aware about James is he really struggled. He, he's, he's progressing in it, but he really struggled right out of the chute of his salvation with law versus grace. And if you track James as the pastor of the Jerusalem church, if you track him throughout the scriptures of the New Testament, you will find a very interesting uh, struggle in his life, which he's growing in. I mean, he's growing, a, he's growing into grace and away from legalism. Uh, I mean, he thought, and listen, you can understand that because he thought, and he was right to think it, that the law was a system of the Jewish faith. Uh, what he missed about it is it became an object of his of his uh, faith of worship rather than bring, understanding that it the law was to bring them to Christ, which was the object of their worship. And that was a missing element in the way he was raised. The law was the, the whole deal. And they threw Christ under the bus, didn't they? I mean, it, the proof of it is they hung him on a cross. Uh, but uh, so James is a really interesting guy and it, it shows you sometimes how difficult it is when you come out of a religious background of legalism, how difficult it is. There's a process of, of growing in grace and, and leaving legalism and it's, there's a process and sometimes it's very difficult. And if you, if you've made that journey in your life, I never made that journey. I didn't come from that background. I came I just didn't come from a church background. I didn't come from that. But I'm, I knew a lot of people that come from that background. I minister to a lot of people that come from that background. It's difficult yeah. because it's an object of faith and a misconception of it, and it's very difficult. So it's a... And uh, in the South, it's, it's, it's ingrained, too, in the South. There's a lot of it in the South. Because there's a lot of good work that you don't find in other places. Well, anyhow, let, let's open with a prayer, and we're going to get into James 2, 14 through 17 tonight. Uh, those that have come along with us tonight by the Internet, we would like to encourage you with the same classroom etiquette that we encourage those who drove by a car and came into the General Assembly, uh, that you understand the principle that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. That's why unbelievers or carnal believers can't understand it. They read it and they can't understand it. Uh, it, it just, they understand the stories of the Bible, but they don't understand the mechanisms to live for but the evidence of carnality is personal sin for a Christian. It's personal sin. And uh, could be mental attitude sins, sins, the tongue of earth sins. And you should confess that in silence and privacy prior to study. The Holy Spirit, what confession does, it puts you back into the, to, to the perimeter or the sphere of the operation of the Holy Spirit who lives in you because you're saved and you're under new covenant teaching. And you can't study the Bible carnality. If you've got personal sin, that's the evidence of carnality. Confession of that puts you back into spirituality where the dynamics of the Christian life is live. Now, for Bible study, that's where you learn to live under the power of the Holy Spirit by the will of God. And so I give you a moment. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins, whatever those are, name them before the Father. And let's, let's learn something tonight that's, revolutionize my, our life and the way we think and the way we live, our trust in God through his word. Father, we're so thankful tonight that these have come our way by automobile and internet. We pray tonight the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of James, the second chapter 14 through 17. When James tells us, well, what's the benefit of faith? What's the benefit? What do we get from faith? What's the benefit? And we really want to understand that tonight. So may the Holy Spirit encourage our hearts in the word of God tonight as we study out of James 2, 14 through 17. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're here around James the second. Is it benefiting it? Uh, how do you deal with crises and adversities in your life? It, how you deal with it will tell you how your faith is benefiting you or not. And so James talks about that in this wonderful passage uh, of verses 14 through 17. What use is it? That's the idea. I'm reading from a, a version that says, what use is it? Yours probably says, what profit? What does it profit a man? Okay. Th that could be that. That word in your Bible could be translated profit, like money profit, that pro type of word, not profit, like prophecy. How does it profit you? It could be how does it benefit you? What advantage does it give you? You see, faith should profit your life. It shouldn't be a need to think. Profit is a gain, isn't it? I mean, when, you're, when your money is working for you, profit, it's not... It's not putting food on your table. I mean, you're not working for, for food, clothing, and shelter, are you? You've got that. That's a given. This is beyond that, isn't it? Do you understand that? Profit. Oh, so he uses this word, and we'll talk about it tonight. What does it, what does it, how, what, how does your faith profit you? How does it, how does it benefit you? To what advantage in your life is it for you to have faith? Because you see, faith should be in the profit section of your life. It should be in the benefit section of your life. And it should be in the advantage. Because the Greek word that's being used for this word means that it adds to your life. It increases your life. It, it adds to. I mean, that's why you save money, isn't it? You know, we say for a rainy day. Boy, we've had a lot of rainy days lately. Um, uh, that made a lot of sense to guys that were farming because we had to be out. I mean, it didn't matter if it snowed or rained. I mean, you, you know, we were kind of like the mailman. <laughs> I mean, it didn't matter. We had to be out there. What use is it, my brother, my brethren? If, if a man, that's a third-class conditional if, and pay attention to three of them. If a man says he has faith, See, what use, what use, what profit is your faith? See, this is what he's talking about. If a man says he has faith, but has no works, can that faith save him? Now, what you can't see in the English is a very important thing. This Greek sentence begins with a negative may, and yet is an interrogative. And we call that a negative rhetorical. It's a negative rhetorical in the Greek language, and here's what it means. Here's how this should read. I'm going to tell you how it should read. It should read, can that faith save him? Listen to me. It can. That's a negative rhetorical in the Greek language. It, requ it requires a negative response. It, it requires a negative response. That's so important to this lesson. It's, it's, all of this will be on your paper in a moment. Then he gives an illustration in 15 and 16. If a brother or sister, and he's talking about in Christ. Now, who is he talking to? Is he talking to believers or unbelievers? Believe. How do we know it? Because the word brethren. Now we have the word brother and sister in Christ. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food. Now, when he says without clothing, it doesn't mean you don't have it. It means you don't have proper clothing for the proper weather. The children don't have proper shoes and, it's, uh, and, and clothing, for example, and it's below zero. They got, all they got is flip-flops. And you understand what I'm talking about? And, and we know that from the way it's laid out. And what? What kind of food? Pantry full? Uh, stored up for the month? Nah, nah, daily. And, and you know what's interesting about that word daily? That's the way God wants you to live. What's he, wh how does he say, the, the you know, teach us to pray, and he says, 
give this, this give us this day our daily bread. I mean, how many of us even think about that? And every time you sit down and put a morsel of bread in your mouth, I'm like Sam Bisman that used to pray. I didn't care. If he put two pieces of bread, he may not pray out loud. He prays for him. He's so thankful to have two pieces of bread. Sam taught me a whole lot about my daily bread. Uh, and one of you say to them, now here, 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 if a brother or sister is without clothing, and one of you, say this is what we got up here, about, if a man says he has faith, He's talking to that man. And one of you who say you have faith. And I'm asking you what benefit is it if you don't let it be active in your life? Now, yeah, right? Now, come on. If any one of you say to them, who's the them? Those that are in absolute need. I mean, this is absolute need. This is not, you understand? This is your daily substance. This is, a, this is not, this is not I, I, I would like to have a car. I'd like to have a new house. I would like to have new clothes. Down and out. This is, we used to, I was a farmer, and we called it dirt poor. Now, when farmers say someone's dirt poor, that's an illustration that only farmers probably understand because I don't know anybody in the city that understands dirt poor. But when you, when you own land and could make money and raise things and you're dirt poor. And one of you say to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their bodies. And this implies, and you could, for you, this would be chump change. You know what chump change is? Okay. And for you, this is chump change. That's the point. Because you're living on the prophet side of life. And when you're living on the prophet side of life, God has given you the prophet side of life so that you can share it with those who are not there. And you can encourage them. You know, there's a, a really interesting thing that is said in our generation today, pay it forward, All right? Pay it forward, pay it forward. And this is kind of the idea here. That's what we call, but listen, be sure it's a grace orientation when you, when you talk that way. Uh, and do not give them what is necessary. This, it's necessity of life. And, and actually in the Greek, you're going to see, they're in the necessity of life and have no ability to change it. You say, well, why don't you go get a job? You can't find one. Uh, or maybe they're disabled and can't do it. Or maybe they're blind. You understand? These people are in an existence that there is no way that they can volitionally change it. This essay, what use is that? What, what use is what? See, what's the profit? What, what profit? It's just the same thing. What was used in 14 is now used again. How is your faith profiting? How is your faith profiting you? How is that profiting faith? You understand? You have the faith to be able to do this. God has supplied Enough for you to do this. This is chump change for you, and yet you won't do that. You tell them that they should go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. And they don't have any way or ability. Their existence is dirt poor poverty. They have to understand the conditions that are going on was great persecution. Uh, both by the fifth cycle and, and against Christ to the Jews. Now, verse 17, he summarizes. Now, what he's going to do is going to give it. Now, listen to me. Look, look up here. He's going to give you a double conclusion. He's going to give you a double conclusion. The first one is in verse 14 through 16. 
with what does it profit you? He went through an illustration where the person didn't do it and should have done it and had the capabilities of doing it and a way to honor God and to give that person a touch from God in a personal need of his life. Now, it shouldn't go without some identity of where this is coming from, right? That this is a God thing. And as for we pray for these things, we shouldn't sit around and complain that we don't have it. We should embrace what we have. We should embrace, we, listen, we should embrace the journey. God will take care of you. It's a Philippians 4.19 in the church age. And so here is a first conclusion. How was, your, how was your faith profiting you? How was it to advantage? How was it advantaging you, positioning you in a way that you can have great ministry on chump change to somebody that needs it and needs it from God? Right? When you get to the New Testament, and the manna is talked about. You know what you know what they say the manna was? Wait. In the Old Testament, when they talked about manna, it was says manna means what was it? What is it? Right? It was a gift from God, is what it was. It was a gift from heaven to earth. In the New Testament, they talk about the man, but it, it was for livelihood. It was to sustain them in a in a journey. It was the proper food for food for the proper people at the proper time, the proper place. For, for the proper thing, that was they were they were in a terrible journey. You understand? It was a journey. All right. In the New Testament, you know you know what that's compared to? What's manna compared to in the New Testament? Huh? Well, it, John six is compared to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And when he talks about eat my flesh, that's what he's talking about. Jesus Christ is the manna. He was in the Old Testament, by the way. But, but it, 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 listen, in the manna, when it came down, that was Christ in the flesh, so to speak. In the New Testament, we have him. The word come, became flesh and dwelt among us. Business. It's just interesting. Just interesting. So when you, when you give a hand up, when you give a hand out, well, however you want to identify that, you're representing Christ. It is the manna. It is the manna from heaven that's come in the flesh, and you do that. Listen, we all do this because of our identity in Christ. I would have never give anybody anything that I work for. If you want it, go work for it. I give people my last dollar today. I've already eaten. Now, I don't give people money. I give them ministry. If they need a pair of shoes, I go get a pair of shoes. I come and minister to them in the Lord. If they need a sandwich, I don't give them a dollar. I don't give them five dollars. Listen, that's not my, that. Listen, there's no ministry in that. There's no ministry in that. This should be ministry. Why, why would you just give somebody a sandwich and not give them the gospel when they could eat the sandwich and while the food is still in their mouth, die and go to hell. Give them food because that's necessity to get them from point A to point B, but give them the gospel, that gets them from earth to heaven. Both. Don't give them one or the other and don't give them money. Give them what they need. You never know what they need until they tell you and you take them to the store. If you give them $5, they may not buy what you wanted. You know what I mean? You may have not said, well, if I knew you were going to spend it on, I don't know, I wouldn't have given it to you. I thought it was of necessity of life. What you spent it on was not a necessity of life. I don't know. I'm saying, though, what it should be is ministry. And I said, Look, how do I know it? What did they say this man was, what, what did this person need? Food and what? Clothes. They need food and clothes. Food and clothes. If Jesus, when he fed the 10,000, he didn't say to the disciples, uh, bring, uh, 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 bring me your money change. I know you don't have enough money, so bring me your money change. Or when they brought it to him and said, Lord, look, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. 
listen, he could have just put his hand on the thing and turned in so he could give everybody there $10,000 or some amount of money to eat for the rest of the year. Could he have not done that? But he didn't. He did not do that. What he gave them is what they needed. Sometimes when you give them a dollar, it's not what they need. You give them $5, it's not what they need. What they need, they should tell you what you need, what they need, and it should be of a necessity of life. But the greatest necessity of life, I'm starting to preach, ain't I? The greatest, I'm still reading the Bible. The greatest necessity of life, but I don't care. The greatest necessity of life is Christ. Because leaving earth and going to heaven is the most important commodity that this earth can give a person. Would you agree with that? Yes. Giving them the gospel is the greatest thing. But listen, what good is it to do that when they need the necess a necessity of life? You get, get them a pair of shoes. Get them, get them something. And in doing it, tell them why this need led them to the greatest need of all, and that's the need of Christ. Because to die and go to hell is the worst thing that could happen to you. Not having a pair of shoes is not the worst thing that could happen to you. Dying and going to hell is the worst thing. See, you see what I'm saying about you? Don't, don't push this off to somebody else because the Lord, you give them that money. The Lord has given you the opportunity to give them Christ along with what they needed. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take a little bit of time out of your life. But listen, when you're dealing with eternity, what's a little bit of time out of your life compared to theirs in eternity? Would you agree with that? See, that's the way I think. That's the way I think. And listen, I'm glad somebody touched my life thought that way. They could have moved on to class. They could have done other things. They stayed and talked to me. I was interested to know how to be saved. Took a while for me to get there, though. It's okay. The Greek grammar structure, now I'm into my study. The Greek grammar structure of our lesson text is important to correct, listen to me, misunderstanding of this passage. This passage involves so much gobbledygook, false teaching, you can't imagine. And it's all about this little phrase, can a man be saved? This little phrase here, can that faith save him? And I'll show it to you in a moment. We're going to look at four things, maybe. If we don't get all of them, you'll get a doggy bag. The work salvation teachers, for the work salvation teacher, the grace gospel is not sufficient in itself. Now, they'll never tell you that until they talk. So you got to listen. The work salvation teachers use James 1.14 to justify adding such things as circumcision, water baptizing, joining churches and walking aisles in order to be saved. Now that, I just wrote a few things down. In, in order to be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. They may preach a clear gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised, but in order to be saved, you got to be baptized. You got to walk an aisle. You got to do this. You got to do that. If you add anything to it, zero. You, 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 you got you to read Galatians 2.21. But they say that. So they deal, they deal with this problem on the front side of salvation. We find that in Acts 15. You know, what must a man do to be saved? Well, their answer was, believe the gospel and be circumcised in order to be saved. Absolutely not. It destroys grace. You, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God or nothing. So you got to be careful with that stuff. So that's the way they, they, talk, they talk the front side of salvation. The other work teachers use it to justify works in those who have professed faith in Jesus Christ as proof of their salvation, they do it on the backside. They believe James is saying, this is their quote, the kind of faith that does not produce works is not saving faith. That's not true. 
It is the work of Christ and the cross that's sufficient to save you. And so they say, if, if they say the kind of faith that does not produce works is not saving faith. So they get you on the backside. They let you in the door on the front side and then take the door away from you on the backside. That's apostate teaching of the new covenant. That's apostate teaching. And they use this passage. So you need to understand an, an important doctrinal principle. Divine faith must have a working object. That working object is always the word of God. The word of God always works because it's based on the character of God and not on the character of man. We're saved by grace through faith and not of ourself. We're saved on the basis of the character of God and not the character of man. For example, the working object of salvation is the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. What must a person do? Romans 1, 16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. That's it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We're saved by grace through faith and not of ourself. It is a gift of God. Eternal life. Eternal life is in Christ. First, first John 5, 11 through 13. Eternal life is in Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. It's not outside of him. It's inside of him. Eternal life is in Jesus. If you have Jesus, you get you in the front door by grace, then take it away on the backside. You got to pay attention to that stuff. And I can't tell you how much of this stuff is preached today. It's just, it's all over the place. It just amazes me. It just, it's a, just an enormous attack on grace. And it just, I don't, for the life of me, I'll not understand why people, why anybody would ever leave this church and the teaching of this church and go out there and set in a church that would teach this kind of foolishness. It is beyond me. There, there's not enough good music or ascetic setting or fellowship that should take away this doctrine of grace. You understand? Why do you do that? Well, I just, I, I, I love the people. <laughs> well, then tell them the truth. What, what good is the fellowship when their fellowship is based on false doctrine? Go join a club that, that, that's altruistic, right? I mean, go find a club that, that makes you feel good when you're together, a sewing club or something, not the church. Gee whiz, people, what is wrong with you? What is going on? Number two. Remember the book of James was written to Jewish believers identified in the first chapter, verse 1, as those dispersed abroad. Now, James is writing in the 40s. So we're well, into the, we're, 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 we're well into the church age, if you count 12 years or so, well into the church age. We're at the very early stages of it. This word dispersed abroad has two ideas behind it. It was written to a church age believer, to church age believers. James, to, to them, James uses the word brethren, my beloved brethren, which is the address throughout this entire epistle, the first chapter, verse 2, 16, second chapter, verse 1, 14, fifth chapter, verse 7, 10, 12, and 19. This is a common phrase he's using to congregational believers, new covenant believers. Okay? This group of people would include those believers at Pentecost in Acts 2, 5 through 13, 36, 41, 47. Well worth your read. And the 15th chapter, verse 20, 23. In other words, these were Jews from all over that came in at Pentecost and really got saved and went back as missionaries. And some moved and stayed there. This is, the, this is the group of Acts 4.12. This is the group of Acts 4.12 uh, uh, that grabbed this understanding in chapter 4, verse 12. 
there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which they must be saved. Boom. This group got it. They went home with that message. Some moved and stayed in Israel. Moved, just moved their stuff. Some came and never left. These, this is a Matthew 121 group. These also include church-age believers being persecuted by the Israelites and the Romans who rejected grace salvation. This is that group of people that it all got, even those who stayed, it got them. Those who were residents, those who came in, Acts 8-1 got them. This is persecution. Listen, listen, what is missed? You know who was persecuted in chapter 8 and 9? You know who was persecuting the, 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 the Jews? It was the Israelites. It was Jews persecuting Jews, right? Saul of Tarsus. It was Jews persecuting Jews along with Romans. But the, Roma didn't want it. They didn't care. They got hooked in just like Pilate got hooked in. Political. It was all political to them. It was, wasn't, wasn't religion. It was politics. But this group got this. So we have, the, we have those under the fifth cycle are the Jews coming from all over to Pentecost, which was a Jewish holiday that was changed forever, right? Jesus said it well when he was at the Last Supper and he said, this bread and this cup is forever changed. The, the whole theology, the whole theology is now going to bring this into fulfillment and it's going to bring in a whole new set of theology thinking, right? <laughs> you got like, oh. And the, boy, were they going to get persecuted for it. And, and Paul says, we all learned a wonderful lesson from the early believers that when you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted if you bear his name. If you honor his name in your life with other people, they will persecute you. And, and, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. That's a good thing because it shows you on who team you play. It shows you on whose team you play. You don't play on the devil's team in the world. You play on the Lord's team. You play on the Lord's team, not on the devil's team. That's what it shows. And you wear that thing. You wear that with a badge of honor. Three. Our lesson title opens and closes with an interesting idea. It opens. In verse 14, we have this phrase, what does it profit? What's the profit? What's the benefit? What's the advantage? Verse 16 closes it. It opens. This opens up in 14 and closes in 16 and then gives a double conclusion. It concludes it and then he gives another conclusion. So we call it a double conclusion. Verse 17 is a double conclusion. It's a conclusion on a conclusion. What was the first conclusion? What does a prophet, man, if someone says, I have faith, and, and, and it doesn't work? But no works. In other words, the faith cycle, whenever it stopped, when, when the faith starts, listen to me now, this is important. When that faith cycle starts, it starts with hearing, believing. When it starts, your faith is in a living mode. It's a living faith. Whenever that stops in that cycle, it's a dead faith. It's dead. Faith can't work. It, it, you stop it. You shut it down. It could be primary. It could be primary negative volition, or it could be secondary negative volition. But you shut it down. Anytime you shut down the living faith working in your life, it becomes dead faith. The, this whole subject is about living faith versus dead faith. It's not about. It's not about grace against works. This passage is about a living faith versus a dead faith. If you read that passage, that's what he, verse 17, in, his, in the double conclusion, he nails it. Boom. He, he drives that second conclusion. It's a dead faith. But you who say you have it and it doesn't work, it don't go through a complete cycle. You have it, brings you right into the application cycle. Do you not, look, if a brother or sister has a need and you know that and you can take care of it and do all that, where's that? That's application, Right? That's the application place. You shut that down, it's now become a dead faith. You understand? As far as active, living dead, right? We know the difference between that, right? <laughs> right? Okay. All right. 
In other words, it's inactive. We, if you don't like the word, he used the word dead. He used the word necros. He's talking about dead like a corpse, dead like an animal, dead, dead, dead. I'm talking about dead. It means it's unproductive. Something dead, you can't tell him. Fetch, here, throw a stick. Here's your dog, he's dead. You throw a stick on and tell him, go fetch it. How's that work? <laughs> okay, well, then you got the idea. Now you got the idea. Okay, so ophalos, ophalos, notice that ophalos is the word that's used about what does it benefit. Notice up there, what does it benefit is used in 14 and 16 identically. It, it's a, what does it benefit is an interrogative pronoun and it has a definite article. It's a predicate, we call it a predicate nominative with a definite article and, and pay attention, it's singular. That's nominative singular neuter. Pay attention, that's singular. What does it profit? And who is he talking about? If someone says, so we track him. We track the person. Now, there could be a large group of people, but it's the person. This is a belief system, right? If someone says it's in a singular, even though it could identify a group. You can talk about legalism. You can have a whole church full of it. Okay. Note the uh, ophalos, now I'm say is singular, and it's attached to the if a man says. And so you want to track that. You, you, that's who you're tracking now. If a man says. Ophalos introduces a doctrinal principle. What's the benefit? What's the benefit? To the someone who says, now this is a spiritually advancing believer who understands prosperity of God. That God, 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 not God, listen, when God meets your needs, that's par. You've played par course. In golfing terms. You've got par. When you've got more, when you're under par, you're in profit. You're an advantage. You're increased. You're benefited. You understand? And it's just, if you don't like golf, forget it. Okay, well, just forget it. When you got a little extra money each month to go get your hair done, your nails done, and uh, have a, what's that real expensive coffee? Starbucks? A Starbucks. Evil organization. I, one of my grandkids said, Grandpa, I want to take you out to coffee. I said, I'll be, let, let me, I got time for that on your, on your dime. I'd like to say, I didn't know you had a dime. I go on your dime. And they took me to Starbucks. And I had the hardest time. If that had not been a gift, I had the hardest time drinking a $5 cup of coffee. I don't care what they had in it. That was tough for me. But listen, I enjoyed it because that was their that that was Grandpa's big treat, and I loved that. I loved the fact that they had a dime, and were willing to spend it on me, and uh, and that was a wonderful thing. But now, when people say, I, when I see a Starbucks cup of coffee, I go like, "Holy cow!" Is I could have, but well, anyhow, <laughs> it, it don't matter. It's, I come from a different world, anyhow. Uh, what's the benefit if someone says? He has faith, but no works, but does not have works. You see, the importance of understanding this is understanding the faith cycle. If you understand this faith cycle, you get a real clear understanding of what he says. And if you don't, you don't have a clue what this means. You don't have a clue. Now, here's what's interesting. In the Greek language, now this is really important. When they put the negative may in the front of the question, the M-E is a negative. That's a negative. And when the, in the Greek language, if you have a Greek, Greek Bible, you will see that they begin this question with me at the front. When they do that, that's, that's a rhetorical, that we call that a negative rhetorical. And it, it, it expects a negative answer. Therefore, that may usually means no, but it's with the word can, which is dunamai, present, middle, indicative. Can the faith, definite article, save him? 
The answer is no. Now, they don't make, who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers, brethren. He's talking to the brethren. He's talking to believers. He's talking to believers who, who have grown enough to understand Philippians 4.19 and the prosperity element of having more, being prosperous in Christ, right? And I'm talking about with the things that you have. I mean, look, don't be ashamed of all the things that God has given you. Listen, you know, you haven't really earned them. Or else you'd still be in a Philippians 4.19. And it's not that you're that smart because he could wipe out everything you invested by being smart in a second. I mean, in a second, the stock market could just bankrupt. Just like that. You, you do know that, don't you? Or if you had a bunch of cattle, a good storm could come through and wipe them completely out. Electrical storm could hit like it did our neighbor, full of hay, ready for the winter, and burn it to the ground. And it, all of it, 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 everything that he had to take care of his animals for the winter was gone. I mean, you need to be thankful that, you're, that you've grown enough where God can trust you with things that he's given you for time that are temporary? Are they not temporary? Everything you have laid up in store for you for whatever reason is temporary because you could die before you even touch it. I had two, two members of my family that were very prosperous. They were really, really good with money and all that stuff saved it all up because they had planned to do what they were going to do in their retirement. None of them lived past five years. Neither one of these two guys lived past five years. When they retired from their work, they were able to retire early, and they were healthy. Five years later, they were both dead. I mean, who knows this stuff? I mean, but listen, for us, when we have this, it's easier to deal with handouts when you're poor or don't have a lot or you two are living on Philippians 419 and you got a you got one sandwich left and you make it up for a guy who needs a sandwich right then it is to have a whole lot and to be responsible for all of that whole lot that you have and how you measure it out in ministry but he didn't give it to you so that you could die and leave it to somebody else he gave it to you so you could spend it wisely for him. Didn't you know that? Oh, I know the Bible says take care of your children, your grandchildren. Listen to me. Have you educated them? They didn't come cheap, did it? And you know what you did for them? You gave them more than anything you could ever give them for their life on earth. You've already given it to them. The greatest inheritance you could have given them, you've already given them. Did you give them the gospel? Did they get saved? Did, they, did you put them in a church just like in a greatest inheritance? Because, listen, the greatest education is the greatest inheritance you get as far as being prosperous in this life, right, in America? By far it is. If, you, if you've been able to school them, right, in some kind of professional class, and, of course, all that you do for him spiritually is eternal rewarded, isn't it? I mean, it's, there's a lot of way to do this stuff, but you got to remember that, I mean, I've spent, I spent a whole lot more time thinking about that than I ever did about Philippians 4.19. I just knew God would take care of all that. You know what's hard is he gave you all this. What am I to do with it before I die? What am I, what am I supposed to do with this? It's harder to do that than it is over here. And if I got an extra piece of bread and somebody needs it, give it to them. So, so much harder to work this one over here. 
because this is in my stewardship. What do you do with it? What do you do with it? Well, anyhow, that's not what I'm after. So when you read this, can, can the faith save him? The, this is, listen, the, listen, this is talking to believers about believers and about this stuff. You got phase one, that's a believer salvation. Phase two, that's a believer, right? That's a church age believer, right? Christian way of life. And then phase three, a believer in eternity. He's not talking about salvation here. He's not talking about salvation here. What was his illustration? A believer helping a believer in need, in necessities of life. And listen, the greatest thing you can do is to teach him Philippians 4.19 if he doesn't know it. Make sure he's saved, all, all, you know, security and all these kind of things. This is all part of that program. But listen, it's not enough to say to him, be warm, go, be warm, be filled, and not give him what you know you're capable of giving him. And listen, we're only, listen, we, how, 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 and listen, he's only asking us to take care of him how, how long? Daily. They take it, didn't ask you to take him in and spend a month, uh, two years with you. you, you uh, daily. You take care of him daily. You, you know, listen, it's so much easier to write him a check and take care of him for a month than it would be daily, right? Because that now that becomes part of your daily responsibility, doesn't it? So, you know, you, your plate's kind of full, and then God says, oh, yeah, well, let's have, and then he wants you to do it, and you you give him something, you, you give him f- something for this day, you give him five bucks and hope he won't come back because you really don't have any, you understand what I mean? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking care of their need for Christ. Their, need, their greatest need is for Christ or to understand the doctrinal level of this. And so there's, I'm talking about ministry. Listen, it's, don't give them money, give them ministry. If it involves that, fine. My, my, my father-in-law was the best in the world. He had this down so good and, and taught me as a young believer the walk. Now, he didn't sit around and talk about it. When somebody came in his office and they come in a lot and they had a child without shoes, he took them across the street and, and to the shop over there and had him, had him put shoes on him and put it on his tab and he, he paid that tab monthly as a businessman and people. Listen, I worked with this old man. I saw coats in the winter. I mean, and, and listen, he was a Gideon. They always got a Gideon Bible and they got the straight up and straight out gospel. And if they were believers, he wanted to know where they lived and listen to me. He picked up and took them to church on Sunday. Carmen Jones. And that's a man who brought me into Christianity the right way. There was a real man right there that understood this principle. And seeing it in the application of it. I mean, he, he dropped his business and walked across the street and dealt with that person maybe for an hour. And then would come back and tell the secretary to write that address down and find out if that was a true address because he just said he's picking them up Sunday and he had their phone number and all that and, and the secretary checked it all out. Mr. Jones had them in church Sunday. It's just, this is exactly what this is talking about. Faith must, must complete the faith cycle. If it's not, that's a living, the living, a living faith is the word becomes alive within us and you begin to move it throughout the chain of events of your life. And that's called the living faith. Verse 17 says, if it doesn't complete the faith cycle, it's dead. James, James uses three third class conditions. And these are really interesting. Now, I don't have time to go through them really heavy. So you got to pay attention. This is a second Peter three, six, uh, 15 through 18 that says, put your what on? Put your thinking cap on. So you got it. But I only got five minutes. So you got to pay attention to me. There are three of them. 
Here's the first one. Two of them, the, the first two third class condition, maybe, maybe you will, maybe you won't. God sets you up in a little test. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. We studied Joseph. He gave me a little test. Will you will? Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But I'm going to tell you what I desire. And if you're smart, you'll do my desire, not yours. All right. And his desire is that you do it by faith, right? Right? Hebrews 11, 6. So here's the first one. And you know, the if is the protesis, and the then is the apotesis. If then. So here's the third class. If someone says, notice that's a present active subjunctive, that's because it's third class condition. That means it's a subjunctive. If you have a third class, you always have a subjunctive. That's a potential or probability. And it's based on an incorrect doctrinal belief. If someone says and then doesn't do it, it's based on it. Where did you get that idea that you didn't have to do that? Incorrect doctrinal belief. If someone says he has faith, but in contrast, he has no works, no such present acts as objective, which means present tense is continuous action. This is an incorrect doctrinal brief that he's operating his life on. He's operating his life based on it. You understand? Okay. Just like Joseph did. Then he, he interjects this in the apotheosis. This is the then part of that first class, that, that third class condition. The apotheosis, he begins with a negative rhetorical. Can the faith save him? And the answer is, tell me the answer. It, it can't. See, See, it's a, it's a negative with a, du, a du, dunami, which means able or can. You can't. The answer is no, you can't. Remember, it's no, no, you can't. Now, here's the second one. Remember, I said there, there, there are two third class with present, with present subjunctives. Now, pay attention to these present. Here's the second one. Here's the process. If a brother or sister is... This word is hupo. I, I wrote it out. You don't normally have an O and an A together, but I wrote it to show you you got a preposition, hupo, and then you have arco, above. You have, you have something. Argo means to begin or a start, starting or a beginning, and hupo means that you're under something. You're under something. And, and this word used is for existence. Here is a person in the present tense of continuous action. This is, it means existence. Their existence, their present condition or existence condition has been, is, is continuously, they are truly in poverty. These are, this is dirt poor. They are without food and in need of daily substance. These two Third class conditions are attached, watch this now, to two heiress subjunctives. See, we got a see we got a series of subjunctives going off this first class. You just got to pay attention. And we we went from this person, the someone who said he had faith, and saw very clearly their condition was exist a permanent existent condition. And that not only were they going to need it today, but they were probably going to need it tomorrow. Okay, and he understands it. You know, it's like the guys on the Samaritan in, in, in uh, the, you know, uh, um, the guy fell among the robbers and the, the priest goes around and goes around. Why did he do that? Does he, did he know his condition was terrible? He was half dead? Did they not know? Yeah, it makes it very clear they knew that. They, 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 they had dead faith. And Jesus talks about, it. and here comes a guy that then is not in that, and out of compassion did it. Nothing, nothing with God, just out of compassion of the human race. He says, which one of these guys did that? Okay. Well, era, these are error subjunctive. Now watch, watch where these are introduced. And you say, go in peace. And it's an error's tense. See, Aris Tent says that this is the way Aris Tent points a pack, a past time where this is a consistent way that they deal with this kind of problem because they have incorrect theology. They're, they have incorrect doctrine, but their doctrine, they're running their doctrine out into their average everyday life this way. You understand? The Aris Tent says that the present tense of their belief is the way they deal with each point in time along the way off this false belief. 
and you say, go in peace. Notice that's an imperative. Go in peace. Uh, and um, go, go in peace. Go, notice that when he gives the three, watch this now. He's going to give three imperatives, and they're in present tense. He switched from the heiress to the present again. He gives them three. He says, go in peace. He says, be warmed and be filled. Notice they're all imperatives. These are commands. And he puts it in the present tense as if he can speak that and that will somehow change their condition. Do you understand that? See, notice these presents to the heiress and back to the present. But you do not give, knows the negative, may, and the heiress tense. But you do not give them. See, this is a pattern of the way he deals with this issue in his life, and it's wrong. He's operating off what's called dead faith. But you do not give them what is necessary for their body. N nothing to say about their soul. We can't even get this guy to give them something to introduce a way to talk about Christ under a grace principle. Right? When you give somebody and there's no strings attached to it, that's a principle of grace that they can understand when you talk about grace. Notice, what's the benefit? What's the benefit of your faith? You talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. You talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. And so he gives a third, a third, a, a third, third class condition. Found, find in a final conclusion, this is, there was one, what's the benefit? Took him through an exercise. Here's the last one. What's the benefit? Even so, demonstrative pronoun, even so, the faith, if it has no work, is, absolute status quo of existence, dead. Being by itself. It's dead. You know, when you're dead, you're alone. It's the ultimate loneliness. <laughs> uh, you're dead. You're dead to everything active, uh, uh, and uh, unless you go to heaven or something. You're being by yourself. Therefore, if the, if the cycle stops, if the faith cycle stops before completion, wherever it stops because of negative volition or incorrect thinking, you have a dead faith. And whatever's operating is, is, is not based on what is it's a dead faith is non productive. That's why it's necros. I just, I'll do it one more time and I'm going to close. I got it, I got it. My dog has died and he's laying here. And I throw the stick out there and I tell him, go fetch. And, it, and he won't, die. I throw it five or six times. I go out and get it, bring it back, throw it five or six times. Now I'm mad and I shoot him. Well, he's dead. Right. I mean, how stupid is this? I'm just saying, how stupid. And here's a guy that keeps doing this over and over. He gets another dog. The dog dies. And he keeps throwing a stick out there. But he's just, just stupid. Now, watch out. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you. See Matthew down at the bottom. Circle that. See Matthew 25, 34 through 40. If you think this is one, he gives you six categories of ministry of this way. You ought to pay attention to them. He gives you six categories. I just dealt with one. There's six. And you should pay attention to these six things. They require, all six of these require personal ministry. And listen, these, listen, these are six that God really cares about. Well, <laughs> let's have prayer. And then we'll have a little moment of prayer, prayer time. Father, we're so thankful for those who have come our way tonight in study with this by automobile, especially because the assembling of ourselves together is so important to me for my ministry, face-to-face uh, -face teaching. And we're, we're glad to extend that face-to-face -face teaching to those uh, by the Internet across the world who would dare drop in with us and study the truth of the word of God. I pray tonight, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to the, to the believer's life. And for the unbelievers, I say, listen, it's time to stop running, 
stop and and believe that Jesus Christ came into this world to die for your if for no one else he died for your sins all of them past present and future all of them died one death for all sin was buried on third day listen to this was raised from the dead oh glory to God it was raised from the dead so that you would understand death death is a door of life you go from life to life if you're a believer. You don't go from death to death. If you're an unbeliever, if you die without faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you, you're a dead person that dies to go to a dead place. If you're a believer, you, you go from a living place to a living place. Oh, yeah. Don't let anybody lie to you. It's your life they're lying about. It's your life. Take charge of it. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. Get saved and get saved today and drop us a line. Go to our website. Study the things about salvation. Look at the 50 things. Study them out. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.